day, everybody, and welcome to the SIP Shelter in Place series on the STIR podcast. I'm your host, Trish Moiko Tobin, and I am joined once again by my binge bestie, sitcom producer, entertainment columnist, and author, Debbie Baldwin. Hello, Debbie. Hey, Trish. How are you today? I'm good. Just plug it away. <laughs> Loving um, this category. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So, you know, for this week's must see movie list, I could sense the angst and the agony that you were experiencing in creating this list, rightly so, because it is almost impossible to limit our top movies from this week's featured actor, let alone try to figure out which ones from that list are the standouts to include in Debbie Baldwin's list. And so we are talking about one of the most popular and recognizable movie stars in the whole world, and that is Tom Hanks. And I mean, if I thought Denzel Washington was hard, <laughs> Tom Hanks, it's almost impossible to narrow it down, which is why we have 12 movies. <laughs> yes, we I normally heard- have Debbie's signature top 11 but this just goes to show how hard it was to narrow down this list. We have a top 12 this week, the first in SIP series history. <laughs> All right, so Deb, Tom Hanks is 64 years old. He is turning 65 in July. Um, he is currently the fourth highest grossing actor at the box office. His films have made a combined $10 billion, $10 billion worldwide. Yeah, not surprising. Um, no, not surprising at all. And he's going to add to that total. Um, he's got a movie that is out right now. It actually was released on Christmas Day and is streaming on Netflix right now. And that is the movie News of the World and described as an American Western. I've seen trailers of it. Um, but he plays Captain Jefferson Kyle Kidd, who is a Confederate war veteran who is charged with returning a young girl, a Native American girl, um, who was taken from her family. So I'm not sure if you've seen that yet or you've seen the trailer, but that is a Tom Hanks movie. And then really what I'm looking forward to uh, for 2021 is the movie that is slated to be released this coming November. And that is the biopic Elvis with Tom Hanks as Colonel Tom Parker. I cannot wait. That's now that I'm looking forward to the one you were describing earlier. I mean, I I would rather jab a fork in my thigh than watch that. I'm (laughs) not a huge like Western person. I'm not either. But the the thing that piqued my interest was that it was Tom Hanks. Um, But yeah, you could watch him do anything. I know. That's true. That is true. So even in the time of COVID, Mr. Hanks has been busy. Um, Gosh, really, Deb, he's been busy for the past four decades. I mean, starting with the 80s, you know, mid 80s. And then the 90s, where it seemed like he had a movie out at least every other year. And in some instances, two movies out in one year. He's been nonstop. Yeah. And a you know, and it's an interesting career to follow because, you know, he's not a conventionally good looking guy. He does not have those, you know, George Clooney looks, Um, but he is incredibly likable. That's likable. He's the ultimate likable actor just, and to step into this sort of leading man role when really like I would think casting agents, especially early on in his career, would have pegged him for the goofy sidekick um, is a true testament to his talent because he right out of the gates from Bosom Buddies, the TV show, (laughs) which was a huge hit and everybody loved it, um, was, you know, he stepped right onto the big screen and never looked back. That is true. That is true. He is every man. He is, you're right. I mean, he just has that universal appeal that, you know, kind of um, reminds you of a Jim Stewart. And um, yeah, yeah. So the very first film on our list um, comes to us from 1984, and it stars Tom Hanks as Alan Bauer. And that is the film Splash. 
And what a way to, you know, jump onto the big screen for Tom Hanks. Uh, this film stars Daryl Hannah. I think everyone knows the premise that yes. she's a mermaid and he cap, uh, 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 discovers her, I think is the best way to say it. <laughs> and um, is trying to hide her secret and has this kind of ET quality to it because the scientists are after the elusive mermaid and Tom Hanks is trying to keep her safe. And of course is falling in love with Daryl Hannah who plays the role. And they name her Madison after Madison Avenue, which I don't know if you noticed this, but the name Madison was never a name before that movie. I mean, it might've been, but it was certainly- No, it wasn't a thing. Yes, but you're right. <laughs> that movie made Madison a name. And uh, everyone watching, all of us, we all know multiple Madisons now. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, but yeah, I think I've traced that etymology <laughs> of Madison back to that film. <laughs> you are right about that. So gosh, Deb, you know, this movie directed by Ron Howard, who um, he passed on directing Mr. Mom and Footloose to work on this film, turned out great for him. And one of his frequent collaborators is Brian Grazer, producer Brian Grazer, who kind of came up with a premise for this movie. The original premise of the movie, which was rejected by studios over and over and over and over again, was to be about um, a mermaid who was adjusting to life in New York City. And after he tweaked it a bit to make it a story about an ordinary man in New York City who meets and falls in love with a mermaid, that's when it was picked up by the studio. So just that little tweak, I mean, similar premises, but there was, you know, just to focus a little bit more on this character of Alan Bauer. And that's how you have this, this winning film. Amazing. And it, what a great movie it is because it's charming, but it also really grabs you. It's got a great yeah. plot. Uh, the acting, you know, Daryl Hannah is perfect in that role. Every casting choice in that film is spot on. John Candy. Obviously Ron Howard. And, you know, these were his early days of directing. Yes. You know, and he, he you know, really showed his talent early on. It's so funny that you mentioned that about, you know, the, the acting in this movie and how the actors were perfect for the roles. Tom Hanks had always joked that he was like the 11th choice for this movie because prior to him, they had considered Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, Dudley Moore, John Travolta, Michael Keaton, and to eventually end up with Tom Hanks, who, you know, my gosh, made the role one yeah. of his, you know, one of his signature movies, definitely. <laughs> definitely. All right. So our next movie, Deb, I mentioned to you, this is the one movie on the list that I am not familiar with at all. It is a remake of a 1972 French film, and that is the movie The Man with One Red Shoe, and it came out in 1985, one year after Splash. And I will say... It, this might be my favorite movie on the entire list. You're it's, kidding me. The one the movie I haven't seen. The Man with One Red <laughs> Shoe. You absolutely have to see it. It stars Tom Hanks, obviously, and he is a musician um, in a symphony orchestra. And his best friend is played by Jim Belushi and is a bit of a practical joker. So we've got that whole story. And uh, Tom Hanks' character is having an affair with Jim Belushi's wife. So there's a lot of um, complexity. Sure. In just that storyline. Then you have this whole CIA plot where the director of the CIA is being undermined by, uh, you know, his the, 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 the next guy down on the ladder and is creating, there's been this scandal and they're trying to cover it up and they're trying to place blame. And the director of the CIA sets up his subordinate um, by claiming there's a man at the airport. He sends one of his underlings to pick up a man at the airport who's going to reveal all of the secrets about this underling. So the underling then follows the guy to the airport, blah, blah, blah. You can imagine what happens. 
hilarity and mayhem ensue. <laughs> into a practical joke of his friend and is wearing one red sneaker and one dress shoe because his friend Jim Belushi has stolen one of each of his shoes. So <clears throat> the spy at the airport sees him and picks him at random out of a crowd because of the one red shoe and it goes from there. This giant misunderstanding, Tom Hanks is oblivious that he is being perceived as this international <laughs> spy. International man of mystery. And everyone's trying to kill him or chase him. And they think his symphony music is code. And they're <laughs> the woman who's played by Laurie Singer to seduce him. And it's just a hilarious storyline, hilarious plot, great acting. The casting's great. Hanks is perfect as the dupe. It's, it's, it's a really, really good movie. Sounds like my kind of movie, yeah. and I am definitely putting that on my list. And that is, again, The Man with One Red Shoe. And yeah. so our next film, Deb, it was nominated for Best Actor and Best Original Screenplay, and it also earned Tom Hanks the Golden Globe for Best Actor in a Comedy, and that is that huge movie from 1988, and that is Big. I mean, what do you want to say about Big? <laughs> that, you know, it's Tom Hanks' iconic movie. I mean, you can talk about, there's other movies on this list that people say, like when you think of Tom Hanks, what was his one crowning achievement? But Big um, really was the, that first film to be a cornerstone in his career. I would think so, yes. The story of Josh Baskin making a wish you know, on the arcade machine and waking up as a full grown adult played by Tom Hanks, runs away to New York and goes to work for a toy store. You know, you've got the, the antagonist played by John Hurd, who's fantastic. <laughs> Hard to believe he's the dad in Home Alone. He's so evil yeah. and big. Um, Elizabeth Perkins as, <laughs> you know, that whole story of Tom Hanks' character, Josh Baskin, who's a 12, a 12 or 13 year old boy in the body of a 30 year old man and Elizabeth Perkins <laughs> trying to seduce him, which is, you know, that's thin Makes ice. a little uneasy, but yeah, it works for but, the movie. Uh, you know, I, I still remember this day when she asked if she can come in the apartment <laughs> and spend the night and Tom Hanks says, yeah, but I get to be on top. And she's like, okay, <laughs> and it's bunk beds. Yes. Oh gosh, it's such a sweet movie. And you know, the young actor who played the young Josh, um, David Mosco as 12 year old Josh. Um, this movie was directed by Penny Marshall. And to give Tom Hanks an idea of how a 12 year old would act and react, um, Penny Marshall had um, David Mosco, the young actor, actually play out the scenes of the adult Josh and have then have Tom Hanks watch the video so he could copy and mimic the child actor's behavior, which I thought oh, was- That's really cool. It was that, fascinating. Like that scene at the office party, you know, when he, <laughs> he eats the- Which he improvised. A little corn cob. But I was thinking when he eats the caviar and he's like, and he's scraping it off, <laughs> trying to get all the flavor out of his mouth. And just the look classic. on his face, the look on his face. My God, I mean, you, he's really captured what it was yeah. like to be a young kid. Yeah. Um, and with this movie, it's notable because Penny Marshall became the first female director to gross more than 100 million at the box office. And what a winner that was because the film's budget was 17 million, so. Yeah, that, that's, a, and we can't, for you know, you can't talk about big without mentioning Robert Loja as oh, gosh. the toy company head who's, takes a liking to the youthful exuberance of the Tom Hanks character uh, in the meetings and <laughs> absolutely gives a, you know, another great performance in a supporting role. It's big is, if you've forgotten about big for your kids, get it, watch it again. I mean, watch it again, watch it again. And wonderful.
Yes, definitely. And speaking of heartwarming and wonderful, our next film also fits the bill. And that is the movie Turner and Hooch from 1989. And it stars Tom Hanks as police detective Scott Turner and a doggy named Beasley as Hooch. Now, it's so funny because when you, you said heartwarming and wonderful and only on a list of Tom Hanks movies, could I look and see like there's like seven yeah. <laughs> but Turner and Hooch is one of my favorites. And you and I were talking about this before we started um, about my inability to cut the list down. And I said, well, honestly, if, you know, two Tom Hanks movies were on television at the same time, like Saving Private Ryan and Turner and Hooch, I would watch Turner and Hooch. Turner and Hooch. <laughs> I love this movie. Tom Hanks is a police detective. He's all buttoned up and neat as a pin. And he ends up with his dog whose um, owner is killed in, a, you know, in the crime that he's investigating. And it's this slobbery, eats everything inside dog. And of course, you know, the, the story, I mean, honestly, it's the love story between Tom Hanks and the dog. And the dog. <laughs> and we've talked about Turner and Hooch before. Um, when we did animal movies or dog movies. And it's, you know, definitely one of my all time favorite films. Oh, definitely. Um, it is just such a warm story. Um, you know, you talk about those two co-stars the title in the title roles. Uh, the two spent a lot of time bonding, of course. And before filming officially started, one of the most challenging things for the two to pin down was just basic walking. Uh, because Beasley, the dog who played Hooch, uh, was a dog de Bordeaux, one of the ancient French breeds of dog, really muscular, hunky, chunky dog. Um, he was so strong that Hanks would frequently drop the leash when they would walk because the dog was so powerful. But um, I just remember that dog, probably one of my most favorite dogs in the movies, you know, of all time. I mean, I mean, when that dog is faking asleep. It's, it's <laughs> so great scenes in that movie. I, now I want to go watch it right now. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so our next movie on the list is one of three movies starring Tom Hanks and his top, I would say, um, rom-com leading lady, who is Meg Ryan. This was the only Meg Ryan movie that made it to your list and also the most successful one at the box office and that is Sleepless in Seattle from 1993. And this is a great movie. And, you know, I, I'm not sure people really realize what an unconventional romantic comedy this movie is because Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan do not interact on camera until the final scene, which it would be incredibly difficult to pull off a love story where the two characters do not cross paths. I mean, other than that one weird highway scene at the beach um, at all. So you've got the story of Meg Ryan, you know, with her fiance who's played by Bill Pullman, who's maybe <laughs> not, you know, who's a wonderful person, I think, and loves her, but is it's not the, He's not the lid for her pot, shall we say. Uh -huh. And then she hears um, Tom Hanks' character's son, Jonah, on a late night radio show, along with half of the, uh, the nation, <laughs> saying how his widowed dad needs a wife. And it becomes this obsession with Meg Ryan. Meanwhile, the Tom Hanks character is trying to rein in the son and be a good dad and has his group of friends, one of whom is played by Rita Wilson, who is Tom Hanks's real life wife of 30 some odd years. Yes. They actually met on the set of Volunteers, which was on my list, but I had to take it off because we can't, I can't put them all on the list. Told you it was painful, yes. Yeah, Sleepless in Seattle, Rosie O'Donnell plays Meg Ryan's best friend. And she was she wonderful in that role. <laughs> Victor Garber, Rob Reiner. I mean, the list of, it's certainly, um, you're certainly okay watching the movie without this intense romance because of the supporting cast, for sure. And it's weird, Tom Hanks is not 
known for his love scenes. I was trying to put that in a <laughs> delicate way. Sure, yeah. Lucario on screen. You know what I mean? There's yeah, not yeah. a lot of heat and passion that comes from him in a sexual way on camera. He is an everyman, the guy next door. Um, he really excels when he's in a like a parenting role, for example, or um, you know, just um, running the show and in, in with friendships and bonding and layered relationships like that. Yeah. So, so the point is, is that Sleepless in Seattle is a perfect film for him. Oh my gosh, yeah. And I think that really goes to show what kind of a unique appeal he has um, to us as, as fans of his. And, you know, you mentioned the fact that he and Meg Ryan don't meet really till the end of the film. And it's only like a couple mi minutes of screen time together. That was it. But that tells you the strength of, like you said, the cast and also yeah. just the script, the screenplay yeah. the dialogue um, with all those cast members interacting. Um, so Deb, you being a fellow Seinfeld fan might be interested in knowing that this movie is notable for its pre-Seinfeld free Seinfeld reference to the real life soup Nazi of New York City. <laughs> yes, there's an office scene in which Meg Ryan um, character, uh, her character Annie refers to him as the meanest guy in the world, but he makes the best soup you've ever eaten. And they were referring to the real life soup Nazi. <laughs> That's awesome, I did not know that. I know, I didn't either until I read about it. Um, also notable for its great soundtrack, just filled with American classics, yes. Jimmy Durante, Nat King Cole, like as time goes by, Stardust makes someone happy. Um, yeah, just a great film overall. And you know, it's interesting, the two children in the film, Tom Hanks' son, Jonah, uh, played by Ross Mallinger, who has retired from acting. He did yeah, a few- You don't hear about him anymore. Things. But the girl who plays his sassy friend, remember they want to know where Jonah went. She says, and why? And they're like, what does that mean? And my, my parent says, no way. And she goes, no, New York. Um, is played by Gabby Hoffman, who has since gone on to a very successful career in film and television and start on the HBO series Girls and yeah. has been in a lot of stuff. So it's funny to see these you know, that was, I'm doing the math in my head, 27 years ago. Right. Seattle, can you believe that? See, I wouldn't have made that connection. When you said the name of the child actress, the name sounded really familiar, but wow, yeah, you're right. That's yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> All right. So our next movie, Juan Hanks, his first Best Actor Oscar in the role of Andrew Beckett, a gay attorney diagnosed with HIV AIDS. And that is from 1993, also the same year as um, Sleepless in Seattle. Uh, Sleepless in Seattle was released in the summer of 93. This was released December of 93. And that is the movie Philadelphia. And this movie, it gives me goosebumps. Like just literally just the mention of the title. This film is so fantastic. It's heart-wrenching and a tearjerker and I hate tearjerkers normally. And I know we've talked about doing a list of tearjerkers, which we can do, but it's never my choice of film. Like I kind of hate being like raked over the coals emotionally, um, unless, you know, it's really, really a, a, a worthwhile <laughs> event. Right, right. Um, this film is absolutely that. Uh, worthwhile event. It's um, Tom Hanks plays a gay attorney who puts up with um, open uh, harassment and abuse, not directed at him, but just directed towards the gay community in general in the workplace. Um, he contracts HIV AIDS, is fired from his job, and subsequently sues the law firm for wrongful termination as he is dying. Um, I mean, it's just so like emotionally packed. You're right. Um, you know, he is starring alongside not only Antonio Banderas, who plays his lover, but also notably Denzel Washington, who 
plays his attorney, um, a homophobic attorney, yeah. um, to to take up his case. You know, speaking of Denzel Debbie, who was the the subject of last week's list, this was his final role in a film to which which he does not play the lead role. Bigger and better things um, were in store for him, as as you know. Um, so yeah, this is when he was supporting role Denzel, and every other film after that is you know. And honestly, even if Denzel, if this film had been made 10 years later, I can't imagine Denzel Washington turning down this role. It's right up his alley. It's complex. You know, you and I talked about Philadelphia with the Denzel Washington list. And I said, well, when you think of the movie Philadelphia, you really only think of Tom Hanks. Oh, gosh, it's yeah. His show, 100%. He absolutely deserved the Academy Award. When you look, when you re recall Philadelphia, you really only think of Tom Hanks. However, the character that Denzel Washington plays, first of all, as the human being I perceive Denzel Washington to be, I would think he would sink his teeth into the role of the attorney who's a homophobe, who realigns his moral compass in the course of the film. I mean, it's, this film is fantastic. Yes, yes. And you, you know, you mentioned that this movie gives you goosebumps, just the mere mention of it. And I completely, completely agree with you because I, you know, personally think the ending of this film is probably one of the most emotionally charged uh. endings in movie history for me. You know, you don't even have actors on screen for those last few minutes of the film. Yeah. You just have a montage of pictures showing a young Andrew Beckett, which were actual pictures of a young Tom Hanks. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you juxtapose it with that Neil Young song, Philadelphia. Oh my gosh, Debbie, I am, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. I mean, I need a break. It's like, I feel like a <laughs> talk, I'm beklempt. Yeah, exactly. It's too much. The end yeah. of that movie, I, if, I mean, honestly, if you're not in a puddle on the floor, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with you. It is, it's beautiful. And even the scene before that with Tom Hanks, Tom yes. Hanks, final scene in the film, everything is beautiful in this movie. It's heart, I mean, I know we say fucking heartwarming all the time, but it's, I mean, it really does like grab it's your heart. True. It's heartwarming and then some, and you know, that song by Neil Young, and I'm really not a big fan of Neil Young, but this song, it just really gets you. And it wasn't even the big song from the movie. Yeah. The big song that won the Oscar was Bruce Springsteen's Streets of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. which was credited by the director, Jonathan Demme, for really bringing more awareness to the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, you know, just the popularity of that song. Really, this film was one of the first mainstream movies to address the AIDS epidemic back then. So it's also um, really noted for that. Um, you know, as we've been discussing all this time, even prior to Philadelphia, Hanks was already a big star, but this was the movie that really in, ensured his place in the pantheon of, of Hollywood greats. Right, the, you know, the Academy Award and, it, you know, there, there was never that. I, I can remember sitting in the theater, watching that film and thinking, I'm sorry for the other actors <laughs> who are trying to win an Oscar this year. And if, no, no chance. And if you thought that, it was also the first of two back-to-back -back Academy Awards for Best Actor for Tom Hanks, the next one being 1994's Forrest Gump. Now, Forrest Gump, um, is a great movie. It is expansive. And I'm sure, you know, if you haven't seen Forrest Gump, I cannot even begin to peel the onion on the plot. Of this, except <laughs> to say, it's the life of this mentally different, challenged, yes. challenged um, man from, from the deep south. Sally Field plays his mother, famous, famous quote, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Uh -huh. this very simple guy and his journey and it's this wonderful journey um i've always talked about the movie big fish which is another film that sort of has a similar yes to it. yes this is like big fish times 10 he goes from you know the vietnam it goes through all of these huge <laughs> eras in american history 
and Forrest Gump uh, is inserted into the timeline of the American zeitgeist. It, it definitely was an adventure watching it. And um, it was different back for back then. Um, the running sequences, you know, big part of the film where Forrest is running across the country. Um, did you know that they were a family affair, Deb? His younger brother, Jim Hanks, um, doubled for him in those shots that you see. I did not know that. Yeah, so um, that was really cool to find out. And, you know, we talked about Tom being one of the highest grossing actors um, at the box office. He was not paid for this movie. Instead, he opted to get a percentage of the profits and Deb, it netted him somewhere between 65 and $70 million. So smart move there by Mr. Hanks. And the nice thing about this movie is there is so much comedy in the movie. So it's one of those movies that really puts you through the pasta machine as far as like you're laughing one minute, you're crying the next, you're terrified at one moment. I mean, it's really hits every note emotionally. So even though um, he had, I think some stiffer competition for the Academy Award that year, he was well- sure did well deserved to win it back to back. Yes, yes. All right, so Forrest Gump was one of three movies in the 1990s in which Tom appears alongside the actor Gary Sinise. The other two, Apollo 13 and The Green Mile, all three were nominated for the Best Picture Oscar, but only Forrest Gump got the award. And so and all three are on my list. <laughs> yes. So with that, we move on to 1995's Apollo 13. I'm telling you, he was busy every year, a movie. <laughs> and I'm telling you, Gary Sinise is another actor who chooses fantastic projects. Um, you know, there's an interesting quote from Gary Sinise when he took the job, you know, he had became um, the anchor character in um, Law and Order. And um, when someone asked him, like, what are you doing? Like, you know, when he made the transition to the small screen and his response was, I'm feeding my family. Oh. You know, it's like, you're an actor, it's a job. You know, yes. I just love that line. So, okay, where are we going to next? Are we on? Apollo 13, and that has, you know, Hanks, unforgettable as Apollo 13 commander Jim Lovell and this movie also directed by Ron oh, Howard mm -hmm. who has described this movie as his favorite among all of those films. And you can see why. This is the stand up and cheer. This is Tom Hanks's stand up and cheer movie. You know he's made a ton that will get you halfway out of your seat. <laughs> Captain Phillips or you know oh, whatever. God. But this one is the real uh, base, you know, it's the real deal based on, you know, Jim Lovell, the astronaut's memoir about the 1970 um, Apollo 13 mission, which, uh, you know, experienced terrible difficulties um, returning to Earth and the astronauts and the men at NASA trying to bring the Apollo 13 craft home. And it's, the cast is incredible. Kevin Bacon, oh Will Paxton, Gary Sinise, Ed Harris. It's, there's not a single actor on camera that is not Oscar worthy in their right. own, in that performance. So yeah, I can see why Ron Howard loves this movie so much. It's, it's a tour de force as they say. Oh, definitely. I mean, he has called it the most cinematic thing he's ever done. In fact, you know, Howard insisted on using his own original shots instead of relying on the footage from the mission. He was insistent upon that. And it really worked because the actual Jim Lovell himself said, you know, he was convinced that the filmmakers found like never before seen footage from the mission when in fact it was the work of Ron Howard. Oh, uh, that's cool. That's a true testament to Howard's talent too, you know, to fool the astronaut. That's amazing. Oh my gosh, yeah. And you know, not only was he insistent on those shots, you know, he he's most proud of that launch shot, the, the, the unforgettable sh uh, launch shot of the, the spacecraft. 
but also um, he was also involved with the sets and with the construction. You know, NASA, the Johnson Space Center in Houston offered the use of their facilities of mission control to shoot there. But again, Howard was insistent. He built his own replica of mission control, was so accurate that the NASA, the NASA consultant they had working on the film <laughs> reportedly would leave, you know, at the end of the day and look for the elevator, <laughs> forgetting, <laughs> forgetting that he was on a film set. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so yes. So you know, what more can we say about that movie? It, it checks all the boxes. It does. All right, so our next movie, um, highest grossing film of 1998, and that is the Steven Spielberg movie, Saving Private Ryan. Okay, so Saving Private Ryan, you know, it's one of those iconic must-see movies. I think it's largely considered to be one of the greatest movies of all time. It really Spielberg's got this very powerful push to tell these stories of World War II and he does them brilliantly. Um, Schindler's List, now Saving Private Ryan. This is the story of a unit of men in World War II who are trying to save the last remaining sibling of um, a group of brothers that have been killed in combat and I get, you know, bring him home so that the family has, you know, one surviving member. Um, the film also stars Ed Burns and Matt Damon, Tom Hanks, it's the Tom Hanks show again, all the way. He's in his element 100% in this kind of milieu with these guys and he's the sort of father figure. Um, you know, this movie is, these World War II movies, that opening scene, I can't even, it's hard. It, Spielberg basically punches you in the face as hard as he can in the first five minutes. And yeah. you, you know, know what you're in for. And it's just this, you know, the horror of war and the human face of war. And it's an incredibly powerful movie and, you know, I I'm, have very little else to say about it. The acting's incredible. It's hard to watch. Yeah, I, I mean, you were right about- It's hard to watch, but you're glad you saw this one when you did. Oh gosh, it's yeah. I mean, but you're right about the punch in the face though, because um, I believe Spielberg, when this film was released, he had requested that no one be allowed into the theater after the movie had already begun. And another request from the studio um, to the theaters was that the theaters turn the volume up um, because the sound effects were critical to the overall experience of the film. I mean, not just the sound, but also just those visual scenes. Yeah. Um, in fact, you know, especially that that opening sequence that you were talking about, the the assault on Normandy Beach. Um, they were so intense. I mean, think about you yourself as the average moviegoer watching that, but even more so for um, war veterans. The Department of Veterans Affairs had set up an 800 number following the real the release of Saving Private Ryan to to handle the calls that they were getting from you know former war vets um, who have been traumatized after seeing the movie. So okay. it it really you cannot describe the intensity that this film brought in, in the, the opening shots. Yeah, but boy, if you've ever, you know, you, you really makes you feel like a spoiled, a spoiled lazy American to see what that generation oh sacrificed my. for us. And, you know, we take it for granted. So uh, this is, I think, a movie that is worth seeing, worth showing your kids, worth you know, every bit of, of respect and the accolades that it has received, 100%. So and one last, yes. Cannot move on from Saving Private Ryan until we acknowledge the fact that Saving Private Ryan lost the Academy Award to Shakespeare in Love. Mired in controversy. Mired in controversy. And I will say I enjoyed Shakespeare in Love. It was a charming film. Gwyneth Paltrow, Josephine's, beautiful. Come on. Yeah. You gotta be kidding me. 
I and know. Other, you know, times in during the Academy Awards where stuff like fluky stuff like this has happened, but this has to be the most extreme example of a screw up. I so, share yeah. your outrage. And for the most part, from what I understand, much of the blame goes to the embattled Harvey Weinstein, who produced Shakespeare in Love for his incessant campaigning on behalf of Shakespeare in Love. But while at the same time, apparently, Deb, he also had launched this behind the scenes campaign, a pretty much a dirty campaign against Saving Private Ryan, mainly by pointing out what he deemed were inaccuracies in the film. So that's kind of some of the stuff that happened behind the scenes, but you're right. Yes, yeah. Saving Private Ryan should have worn the Oscar. Oh. Yes, that year. They should, you know, retroactively, <laughs> we miscounted. Oh my gosh, you are so right about that. You are so right about that. All right, we are gonna move on to the year 1999. And we are going to talk about um, The Green Mile, which is an adaptation of Stephen King's novel. So it's probably, you know, he's the author, Stephen King has considered this the single most faithful adaptation of his work. And honestly, and we talked about the Stephen King adaptation stuff you know, with The Shining. Which and, Stephen King felt the opposite about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Green Mile is a fantastic movie. I don't know like what I expected. I think when I, when I went into it, I was expecting uh, more of a um, Shawshank Redemption, also Stephen King novel. Um, also directed by Frank Darabont, and that's probably why you were expecting, and, yes. But The Green Mile is something totally different. It's this recollection of a prison guard in depression, uh, during, a depression during the Depression, um, and this unusual encounter this prison guard has with an inmate who's on death row, played by Michael Clark Duncan, uh, who does get an Oscar nomination for this role, rightfully so. Um, and he seems to possess some supernatural power. And it's the, just the unfolding of the story. I don't want to give too much away because a lot of people haven't seen The Green Mile and it's right. really, really special. The acting's incredible. The story, you know, it's, it's a little rough. Like it's hard, to, it's painful to watch at times. You know, little Mr. Jingles, the mouse. <laughs> um, but all, everything works out for Mr. Jingles. So don't, yeah. don't let that put you off the movie. But it's just the story of this prison and this, you know, prison guards and prison inmates who are, some are good, some are bad. And this one character, my, played by Michael Clark Duncan, the character's name is John. And his ability to kind of heal. And it's a very poignant story. It's a brilliant, you know, the King novel is, is the source material is fantastic. And they did, as King said, a fantastic job adapting it to the screen. Oh my gosh, yes. So, you know, unforgettable performances. You know, you mentioned the Shawshank Redemption and Shawshank Redemption and just the, um, the synergy between this movie and Shawshank. Um, so both movies directed by Frank Darabont, um, Tom Hanks was considered for the main role um, for Shawshank Redemption, but he had to pass because he was working on Forrest Gump. And so this is his, he, you know, kind of like making up um, to the director. And this is why he, he considered and accepted the role of um, For the Green Mile. Darabont calls this film, The Green Mile, his most satisfying movie of his career. And that would be tough for me, you know, considering yeah. the Shawshank Redemption too, also one of my favorite movies. So, um, I, uh, yeah. And I mean, honestly, I can't imagine anyone else in that role besides Tim Robbins. Yeah. He's so powerful. And Tom Hanks has a different vibe. They're both incredible actors. Robbins was absolutely the better choice. Oh, perfect for that role. Yes, I think it's his best role. So, um, okay. So it was during the filming of The Green Mile 
that Tom Hanks started gaining weight for his next project, the next project on his schedule. And it was, you know, it wouldn't be a stretch, Deb, because, you know, to have a middle-aged prison guard was a little pudgy, was fine for the Green Mile. But actually, he was gaining weight for the movie Castaway. Pre-production, he had gained about 30 pounds so that his weight loss would be more dramatic, um, you know, for later parts of, of the movie Castaway. Yes, and Castaway, um, you know, Castaway is an incredible film. The performance is incredible. It's all Tom Hanks. This one's literally all Tom Hanks. He's yeah. on an island by himself. The title of the film is Castaway, two words, as opposed to a castaway, like Gilligan. Correct. Um, he has been cast away and he plays a FedEx employee who survives a plane crash and is ship, shipwrecked, plane wrecked on this island with his basketball, volleyball, I mean, ball, <laughs> his ball named Wilson. His co-star, yes. <clears throat> Someone once asked him in an interview, I think it might have been on the Tonight Show, if he had named the ball Wilson after his wife, Rita Wilson, and I don't, I can't remember the name, but he said, well, since her real name is Rosenstern, like it was some very Jewish last name. I can't remember what it was, but it was hilarious. He was like, no, I did not name <laughs> Paul Wilson after my wife. It was after the, the maker of the volleyball, Wilson. Yeah. And that's yeah. where, yes, we get um, the name. And, you know, um, one other really um, in your face product placement, and I really hesitate to call it that because FedEx, prior to what some may believe, did not pay for anything um, to be involved in this film. In fact, the FedEx executives were at first reluctant to play a role in the film because the idea of one of its, uh, its planes crashing was not yeah. good for them. But um, they realized eventually that you know, the overall story was positive. And for them too, for FedEx, the company, it was positive. Yeah, he returns the package, very delivers yeah. the package. Yes, and it increased their brand name recognition in other parts of the world. Even job applications for the company reportedly went up about 30% following Castaway. So, you know, yeah. wow. You need to think, oh, I just saw this movie where a guy almost dies in a plane crash working for FedEx. I think I'll apply for a job there. They yeah, I, I thought the same thing. I thought the same thing. But yeah, yeah. Maybe, you know, it was the the, the dream of, of ending up in Fiji somehow. Even after your fate <laughs> plane crashes, you end up in Fiji, which is right. not bad. <laughs> you an island with a bunch of packages. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our final movie on our list features one blockbuster lineup, not only Tom Hanks, but you have Paul Newman, Jude Law, and Daniel Craig, and hello, Pebbles Baldwin. Oh my gosh, she wants attention. Pebbles is coming to, to talk about the, I wish we were talking about a comedy or Turner and Hooch. Or Turner and Hooch, she was late. But she the road late to Purdue. You. <laughs> darkest. Right. Oh, oh gosh. Oh, now, Road to Perdition from 2002. Maybe my personal favorite if we're talking about a Tom Hanks drama. Um, what a movie. And I'm telling you, this is, goes with my theme that there's something about Tom Hanks that's very parental. You know, so when he's playing a father on screen, he's really at his best. And um, can you hear the dog? She's attacking like a- He's attacking something. What is going on? <laughs> Pebbles, stop. <laughs> okay. So Tom Hanks is really at his best when he's you know, in this parental role. And this is the iconic example of that. He, is, he plays a mob enforcer um, during the 30s. Uh, works for the, you know, the mob boss played by Paul Newman, who considers him an adopted son. He's basically yes. raised him as, you know, from it, Tom Hanks was orphaned as a young boy and, and this mob boss has raised him. So this creates this kind of rivalry between Hanks and his biological son. 
I can't stop her. I don't know. Um, between Tom Hanks and his biological son, played by Daniel Craig. And it sounds like she's gnawing on your foot. The craziness of living in the Baldwin household that's gotten to her. I don't know. But um, and the road to perdition, when you have one of these mob movies, there's always this growing, you know, you get this pit in your stomach. It happens during Goodfellas, it happens during The Godfather with any good mob movie, there's this almost constant pit in your stomach for when things flip on a dime. Oh you know, God, yes. So wrong. And it's and, the most awful feeling. It's this sense of foreboding. Right, you know, you foreboding, see- exactly. Things oh. are not gonna end well. And you know, this is the story of Tom Hanks's character trying to keep the sun safe while you know all these different factors are, are weaving together to you know, Tom Hanks is trying to uh, take care of business for the his mob boss and the, the biological brother, Daniel Craig, is trying to undermine Hanks. Hanks is trying to defend himself and protect the son. And there's a lot going on, but it's a complicated, but like the film is like a symphony, the way all of these storylines kind of weave together and has this very beautiful powerful ending it's it, it, it i'm glad we're ending on this film it's it's i had forgotten honestly how oh. good it's a great film such a masterpiece deb and you know when tom hanks first got a hold of this script it was while he was filming castaway and he was so busy you know in in that role and just the production of castaway that he wasn't really into the script too much but after taking a closer look at the script he is reported to have said okay i i really get this guy this michael sullivan uh, the role he plays if you're a man and you have offspring emotionally it's just devastating and you really feel that it is so gut-wrenching to see him in his efforts to try to save his son. Um, You know, we talked about this sense of foreboding, this pit in your stomach, and it's not only achieved by the acting and the storyline itself, but you know, the one thing that I also remember about this film is just the lighting and the cinematography. It was so haunting. And And in fact- The Academy remembered that too, apparently. Yes, it won the Academy Award for Best Cinematography. My gosh, it was just the entire time, Deb. I was so enjoying watching all these actors in this movie, but you weren't really happy. <laughs> you weren't, you know, you, you, you were dreading what was going to happen next. Yeah. yeah, you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. At this, and, the, you know, that sense of anxiety. Actually, this is a movie, this is one of those movies that is better the second time you watch it because it abates some of that, you know, anxiety. Okay, see, I didn't look at it that way. Didn't want to watch it again because I didn't want to go through that again. No, you can really, like if you're, I don't know, like us and you're like, yeah, I don't want anything bad to happen or what bad thing's going to happen. The second time that you know. (laughs) You kind of, yeah, that's true. That's true. the, The subtleties and this whole dynamic of father and son that takes place not just between Michael Sullivan and his son, but between Michael Sullivan and the Paul Newman character, Daniel Craig and the Paul Newman character. There's all these different relationships that have a paternal component to them. So it's really, you know, not to overanalyze, but it's a it's a brilliant film in that respect as well. Yes. Most definitely, I completely agree. This film was Paul Newman's final film. Um, Again, this came out in 2002. The actor passed away in 2008. So, um, you know, it's it's notable and, and worth watching just for that, for his final performance on film. So, you know, and then the final scene that you had referred to, it's so tense and so haunting. The final 20 minutes of the movie, they only had six lines of dialogue, Debbie, in the final Isn't 20 that amazing? minutes. Yes. Amazing. And yet you are so and so much happens. Like, you know, you see all these dynamics shift. Uh, the sun in particular, you know, that's the most fascinating part of the film is, you know, with the Tom Hanks and the and the and the sun and that dynamic of what goes on in those final moments is brilliant. Yes, yes. Well, okay, 
Thank you, Debbie. Another fantastic list, but really with Tom Hanks, how can you go wrong? How can you go wrong? You cannot. <laughs> All right. So we are approaching the end of January, but we really are still in the thick of winter. So we're bringing you for our signature sweet treat, um, some winter comfort with dessert that you can drink, Deb. And we are talking about Coquito. And that is um, originating in Puerto Rico, kind of referred to as the Puerto Rican version of eggnog, but really the flavor profile is a little different. Um, it's more coconut rum and a dash of cinnamon as opposed to, you know, your, your traditional eggnog. It's really delectable and it hits the spot. All right. Sounds good to me. Yes, and you know, a bonus, what I found out the following day that I made my Coquito, it makes for a great coffee creamer. <laughs> oh, I was going to say that. Yeah. So yeah. if you love Irish coffee, yeah. you're going to love this. You're definitely going to Coquito coffee. <laughs> so um, very easy to make, throw everything in the blender and you've got yourself Coquito. And we will have that recipe for you on gazellemagazine.com. And Debbie, we don't want to end things without mentioning your newly released book, Illicit Intent, which came out a couple of weeks ago already, where we're hearing about the rave reviews, Deb. Uh, it's, I, I'm kind of blown away. It's um, been very well received so far. So hopefully we'll keep rolling with that. And uh, it's available um, in hardback, paperback, and ebook on all online booksellers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Google Play, Apple, iTunes, um, or not, um, Apple Books, sorry. Apple Books. And um, yeah, so um, grab a copy of Illicit Intent if you want to start off with False Front, the first book, and read them as a series. I think that's more enjoyable. That's um, what I would recommend. Said, on their own. Yes. All right. So it's really easy to find. And that is Debbie's follow-up book to False Front, Illicit Intent. And that is now available at all online booksellers. As always, thank you, Debbie, for this week's must-see movie list. And thank you all for joining us. And we will see you again next time. Bye. You, Bye. Thank you.